maybe we don't want to get into this, maybe we do, but there's this whole issue of APOC3. And you know, it's not it's not a simple story. Oh, these are lipid lovers. Of course they want to get into it. Well, APO. yeah, yeah, I do, but not necessarily for all of our audience, but but I think there is there what I'm interested in understanding better, and you may be able to help us here, Deepak, is why. What were the drivers? What is what are we doing with with this therapy that's making risk go down? How do we how do we interpret and understand this? You know, I think it's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I think it'll play out over the next decade or so, much like even statins. The complete mechanisms of action weren't fully elucidated in the initial launch of statins or with the initial trials like 4S. I think it'll take a while. I mean, within the trial in terms of correlations with biomarkers, at least to date, and preliminary analyses as presented at the FDA, the only thing that we saw some sort of correlation with in terms of biomarkers was the EPA levels. That is, the EPA levels in general in Western populations, by EPA level I mean eicosapentaenoic acid level, and the blood is low. We gave a highly purified ethyl ester of EPA, and the EPA levels went up by a lot, by over 350%. And those changes seem to at least uh, correlate with subsequent outcomes. And we didn't find clear relationship with any of the other biomarkers that to date we've studied. But you know, both of you have given the issue a lot of thought in the context of the REDUCE-IT trial, but even for years before the two of you even think about it, what do you think? Well, uh, you know, I think uh, some of this hinges upon really the, the very nice work, uh, the basic science work that Preston Mason uh, over in your neck of the woods has done in right. showing that EPA does have differential effects uh, with respect to LDL oxidation, for example, and intercalating and stabilizing cell membranes compared to longer chain fatty acids like DHA. Um, so there's reduction in inflammation and oxidation, inflammatory characteristics. So uh, there's also some literature on endothelial function. So I think all of those, if you look at a hypertriglyceridemic patient that manifests a lot of these pro-atherothrombotic tendencies, maybe EPA does work not only by lowering triglyc triglyceride levels per se, but the company it keeps. So, you know, Deepak, it's a, and it's, you know, we talk about precision medicine, and basically in terms of designing the trial, Steve, you know, there were the, the, the JELUS trial was done in Japan. Uh, they gave EPA, they already had a fairly high level of EPA at baseline, 1.8 grams on top of low-dose statin. Uh, there was a subgroup that had high triglycerides, low HDL, and based upon that, this trial was designed to be somewhat enriched. It wasn't um, but there was no HDL criteria. Now, in, in the strength study, which you're the, the uh, PI of, that was more strictly adhered to uh, 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 for it. But so what was done, this was a little bit, if you think about EPUC 4S, they started with a group that had a very high LDL. They showed a benefit. So here, and what was done was to take the population, which based upon a hypothesis generating study, would be enriched for risk and tested in that population, which is the same thing that's being done, which would be nice to have a second trial. What happens with statins, we found out that they worked in a very broad range of patients. Yeah. So, which is interesting, Deepak, because, you know, it was, it's really not clear that we, as you pointed out, that, that we really have to have these, tri with what, what, what would be the patients that this could work in? It may be a broader range of patients. We know it worked in the population that was studied but it was, it was selected to be a group, it was a, a narrower group than the JELA study uh, with it. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, just the JELA study for the audience who, in, in fact, even among subspecialty cardiologists, a lot of people nobody either knows don't, yeah, nobody knows about JELA's. It's not even that they forgot about it, it's that they didn't even <laughs> know about it. They never but, knew. Yeah, exactly, but you know, it was a large uh, Japanese study uh, where patients were randomized to 1.8 grams a day of EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, a lower dose, uh, different formulation from what we studied, but basically uh, uh, largely the, the same active ingredient. Uh, and there, there was a significant reduction, a 19% relative risk but reduction. But it was statistically a little bit more. It, was, it wasn't like the p-value that you had, which was very robust. They had a you know, very nominal. Oh, there were issues with the trial. But you know, overall positive, overall, overall secondary primary prevention cohorts consistent benefit. But you're right. I mean, as a trialist, you know, no placebo control. It was open label. Um, it was a low dose of statin, but again, at that time, you know, in Japan, not such an unusual practice pattern. And, and, and a group of patients that uh, eat a lot of fish, yes. too. So what, what you haven't mentioned, though, is the safety of the drug, right. which I, I think is another key component when we're thinking about adding a medication yeah. Yeah. onto other medications, right? Yeah. And, and so 
really well tolerated. Yeah. And, and this is one of the few medications that people come to us asking to be on, wow. right? right? Yeah. How often do they say, put me on a statin? So before we get back to that, I just wanted to make one more point in response to Christy, which is that uh, I know you know this, but I want to make sure the audience knows this. If you look at all of the other, quote, triglyceride-lowering therapies, the fibrates and various other studies, and then you look at the subgroup in those studies that had high triglycerides, low HDL, there is a signal, you know, and subgroup analyses are risky, but what was done in Reduce It is based upon not just jealous or anything else, is the idea that the prior studies that looked at therapies didn't study the right population. And, you know, if you think about it, it'd be like starting out with statins, studying people whose LDLs are 70, you know, it probably wouldn't have worked out as well. In 4S, it was, was 180 milligrams per deciliter or something like that. Maybe it was 160. It was, yeah, it was pretty high, you know, and you made the point, and that was the right thing to do with reduce it. It was clearly the right thing to do. And we did the same thing with strength. Right. And we'll get, we'll learn that. And somebody may someday go back and sort of do another set of studies and look at different populations to see if they benefit. But that signal was very strong for other things. And you, I might point out that Paul Ridker's doing a study with pemafibrate, which is a prominent new fibrate. Prominent is the name. Was it? No, I was just telling Dan, it's prominent is the name. Prominent is the name of the study. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a contemporary fibrate study, and I'm sure, I haven't seen the design, but I'll bet you anything, he's studying high triglyceride, low HDL positive. Yeah, it's, it's very similar to strength, actually, in many aspects, the design. Low HDL, high triglycerides, a mixture of secondary and high-risk primary prevention. Another important trial, still enrolling, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, very we'll know, in, we'll know in about four or five years, probably, what whether that works. Right, yeah, so very complementary sets of trials in terms of understanding the science and exactly what mechanisms may provide clinical But benefit. we got off track because there was an overreach, you know, to do studies in, in broad populations first. And you made the very important point, you gotta study the narrow population first, and then you think about whether you can broaden the indication. Absolutely, and, and part of what also has hurt this particular field is just some of these studies of the supplements or, or those low doses, the, the one gram a day. And otherwise healthy BPA, people. DHA, right, yes. yeah. So that, that really has hurt things. But um, uh, you, you were talking about safety though, Jamie, that's an important uh, yeah. point to consider in any drug. And just so the audience is clear, we did see an increase in hospitalization for atrial fibrillation or flutter with icosa pentethyl versus placebo, and also a significant increase in minor, though fortunately not in major bleeding. So two things to be aware of. But overall, well tolerated. And in the overall and no increased trial, risk of stroke in the AFib patients. You no, know, right? in fact, a 28% reduction overall in, in stroke in the trial and consistent findings, even in those with a history of right. AFib at baseline, and even those who developed AFib during the trial. So overall a reassuring safety. Deepak, uh, you know, um, the bleeding I understand because we've always known that the, that the fish oils have effect. What I didn't expect or understand is mechanistically. Do you have any insights about why atrial fibrillation goes up? Uh, no, not really. I, it, it's something that's been described before in the omega-3 world, so it, it's not the first time. So it does make it a little bit more likely that it's a real finding and not just a spurious yeah. finding. Uh, the AFib was pre-specified and adjudicated, uh, but the absolute increase in that endpoint was small. It was a 1% absolute increase over an average of five years. You know, the chair of our data safety monitoring board, Brian Oshansky, is an electrophysiologist, Amina Chung, uh, mm -hmm. and other electrophysiologists on the data safety monitoring board. And you might wonder, why did we have electrophysiologists on the data safety monitoring board of this lipid trial? It's because even early on I was thinking there might be arrhythmic potential or anti-arrhythmic potential. In either case, I thought it couldn't hurt to have some electrophysiologists aboard. And their interpretation of the AFib signals, they actually didn't think it was that big a deal. Uh, and in fact, when a trial is showing a reduction in sudden cardiac death, the proportion of which might be malignant ventricular arrhythmias that are reduced, you know, they said, look, put if, it in context, not a big I, deal. If I could trade a reduction in sudden death for an extra few atrial fibrillations, I'd take it every day <laughs> of the week for me. And, uh, you know, one of the things, too, that we, we presented at the FDA, we've got to actually uh, get all this stuff uh, uh, peer-reviewed and published, but, but we did present it at the FDA, was that in, in terms of the increase in AFib hospitalization, it was largely in people that already had an identified history of AFib. The de novo AFib rate was extremely low. So 
Uh, so overall, I think what Jamie said is quite accurate. It, it's, it's a safe drug. And, and overall in the trial, in a blinded trial, a placebo-controlled trial, it was as well tolerated as the placebo. That is, if you look at significant adverse events, either in a very sensitive fashion or a very specific fashion, like SEs leading to death, uh, not only statistically, but numerically almost identical. I guess the other, only other thing is there's just a little bit of GI. With fish oils, there's often just a little bit of GI intolerance that yeah. almost always goes away over time. Yeah. And so one of those therapies, like metformin, where you, you have to just wait out the, the, that adverse GI effect and it will tend to diminish over time. Yeah, no, that's another important point. But maybe you could just say a few words, since we talked about other trials about strength, if you just want to update the largely primary care audience that's listening. Yeah, so um, strength is uh, using a carboxylic acid derivative uh, of both EPA and DHA. Uh, the putative advantage is that it is a better absorbed, gets higher blood levels, which I'm gl glad to hear that you found blood levels to be correlating, so that although it doesn't have pure EPA, it actually gets similar EPA levels um, uh, to what you saw in, in Reduce It, uh, but it also has DHA. And uh, so it's an enhanced bioavailable uh, product. Uh, we're studying a population with high HDL, I mean, I mean sorry, high triglycerides, low HDL. Uh, it's a little higher fraction of primary prevention, so may get more information about the primary uh, prevention, but it's a very similar trial. It's, an, uh, patients are probably not quite as high a risk. It's 13,000 patients. Same number of, uh, of endpoints uh, required to terminate the trial, so it'll have comparable statistical power, and it'll be another opportunity to see whether or not in this population a different fish oil-derived product with a little bit different pharmacological profile produces similar or dissimilar effects. As you know, you can't compare across trials because they're different populations, but it, it it would be very good for the field, obviously, to have a confirm. It's always good to have confirmatory trials, and we've done this in statins, and we took I don't know how many trials before we decided we could no longer do placebo-controlled statin trials, but uh, we're going to get there now with, uh, with two, I think, reasonably well-powered trials.